Welcome to episode 73 of the Monday Morning Critic. Today we have a very special guest. She's one of my favorite athletes on the planet, and she might be one of the best athletes on the planet as well. Her name is Lael Wilcock. She's an ultra-endurance racer. Lael has won a Trans Am, Tour Tour Divide. We're going to get into her career in a moment. She's calling from Switzerland. I'm psyched. Lael, how are you today? Oh, I'm doing great. Yeah, I've been in Switzerland for about a week, and I'm just riding my bike as much as I can. Yeah, I gotta say, I researched your life, and it's it's just mind numbing. But I gotta tell you, the one thing, Lael, that really bothered me about your life is that they keep referring to you as the best female this and the best woman that. Stop it! She's the best cyclist on the planet. Stop it! <laughs> I don't know about that. You know, it's like I do my best, but everybody has their days. I, I know a male that uh, that that you competed against in a Trans Am that might agree with me, but that's a story for another day. I I, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I your achievements. There's not many people, male or female, that can do the things that you do, Lael. And I, and I apologize if it sounds over uh, patronizing here, but my goodness, what you do. I mean, the rides you do just on a just messing around. I don't think most people can do. I think you know all this stuff. You kind of have to build into it, and then. I'm really only out there because I love it. Mm. You know, it's it's kind of a, a different thing just just going for days and days and miles and miles. But I'm, I'm having a blast. I, I love what I do, and I'm just going to keep going. Yeah. So I want to get into your in, into your accomplishments in a moment, but I kind of want to start off. So so Dad's an attorney. Um, Mom is a teacher. Am I right with that? That's right. Are they ever worried about? And I, I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer. Are they ever worried about <laughs> you when you go out and, and you're you're? I mean, because I read a story about you today, and I'm going to get to this down the road too, about uh, a place, and I think it was Canada, where it was. Uh, I'm, I'm about to say Trail of Tears. I'm completely incorrect. The Highway of Tears. Yes. Oh my goodness. I don't want to get to that yet. But I oh, was like, man. I was like, this person has more courage in her like pinky than I have in my whole body. I mean. We'll get to that in a moment, but do your parents, they worry? I know you have a satellite phone. I get that. They can kind of track you, but the worry. They, they really, uh, they don't, you know, they, they're they excited about what I'm doing, and I don't have a satellite phone. Because mm, when, I, when I read they said you had a, maybe it was a GPS tracker or I something. This, yeah, I have a spot tracker, so if I actually just bought a new one, I haven't had one for about two years, um, but it'll send a signal uh, my, to my location if I have it on tracking. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. So, what what are mom and what are mom and dad's kind of um, how do they feel? I mean, you have a, a lifestyle that's I'm very envious. Let's put it that way. Um, most people that are in an office that are you know, and I love my job, but my goodness, the, no two days must be the same for you. No, they aren't, and you know it's. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm amazed at what I'm doing now. I never really thought I'd be riding for so long. I really only started riding when I was 20, and that was just to commute to and from work. And now I'm 31, and I'm just riding more and more. Um, you know, I, I started with the bike as kind of a vehicle, and it still kind of is. You know, it's like it's taking me to all these amazing places, seeing new things, um, and then just kind of having – having the bike in common with people in the world, it's like you become so much closer with them. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's, it's good. Yeah. So, and, and I was, and I was, when I was doing research, I saw, you know, a picture of you, you did cross country for a while in college. Is, is that correct as well? Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. How much of that goes into, I mean, you know, cause I mean, that's another sport where you're, you're spending a lot of time in your own head, you know, and it's like you're on mm-hmm. your own a lot. I mean, any of that play into what you do now? It does, and also for kind of a bigger reason, too. I mean, I was a runner um, to start, and I actually got went through an Achilles injury where I couldn't run for about a year. And so at that point, I just started riding, riding further and further. I think mostly because I was frustrated that I couldn't run and I wanted to so much um, that it really kind of pushed me on the bike. And, and I don't think I would have ever attempted this ultra-distance riding if I hadn't been hurt in the first place. Mm, mm. And, 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 you know, you graduate with, with a natural science degree, and I, and I have to ask you, French literature, um, if, if we never got if we never got into biking, Lael, what, what kind of career are we looking at? I have no idea. You know, I, uh, I started college thinking I'd go to medical school and become a doctor, and then 
uh, I don't know, about my third year in, I realized that really wasn't what I wanted to do. And, and then I graduated and then I got on my bike and that was it. That's what I, that's what I've been doing since. And I, and I imagine, cause I know just from reading about you, you're, you're always on the go. You're not one of these people that's okay being complacent. You know, I imagine watching movies is not one of your big hobbies. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, it's not not my thing unless I'm it's so exhausted I can't do anything else. <laughs> because you remind me, you're, there's a movie called The Martian. It's not I'm not calling you a Martian. It's Matt Damon's <laughs> character. He's st- he's stuck on um he's stuck on Mars, but it's it's really admirable how he goes about you know getting his way off the planet. You know he's he has a lot of time alone. He's fearless. He's smart. He's away from home. He's resilient. He re- he just remind. He just kept coming to mind when I was researching your life because you have all those things, right? You spend a lot of time in your own in your own mind, um, you, a lot of time alone. You're fearless. You're smart. Um, I don't know. Do you do you agree with that? I mean, I know you haven't seen the movie, but ha- do you agree with that assessment? <laughs> I haven't seen the movie. I mean, I agree that I'm pretty weird. <laughs> you know, Russian <laughs> sounds pretty apt. Uh, I mean, I just like it out there. You know, it's like I like all the time to think. I like what I'm seeing. I like spending that much time outside. You know, it's like especially for these races or long rides, like I see every sunrise and every sunset. And, um, you know, I'll cover like 200 miles in a day. So everything changes every day. And I really like that. Um but yeah, I feel most kind of relaxed when I'm moving, when I'm like actually running or riding or walking. It just kind of puts me into this place where I feel like I can think more clearly. Yeah, and, and I get that. And, and by the way, Matt Damon was a rocket scientist, not an actual Martian. I want you to know that I'm not calling you an alien. I feel so bad. Um, so, uh, um, so, yeah, so what I have to ask you is like, so I bike a lot and um, I, I – I'm sore at five hours and maybe whatever, 60 miles. I can't go any further. I don't know how you do 200 miles. I mean, granted, you're in 20 times better shape than I am. But still, I, there's people in worse shape than I am that can do twice as much as I do. And I don't – how do you do it? How do you well, – What do you think your limiting factor is? I mean, what makes you actually stop? So I read an article where um, you said that you kind of – coax yourself and saying, you know what, let's see how I feel after an hour. <laughs> yeah, you know? Okay. True. So like I, I'm at like, my head is like, oh, your my butt hurts. You know, this is, I'm exhausted. I can't move my hands, but you know, this is a good four or five hours into it. I've already talked myself through the ride. I don't know. I wish I had that kind of, um, I don't want, I don't know what to call it. You, you have it. Like you have the, the motivation to kind of push yourself to another level. I think I just top out and it's like, if you, have, if you have advice, I am all ears on that. Well, I would say, you know, it's like, it, what do you do at that point when you stop? I mean, do you take a break? Do you get on a train? Do you have a meal? You know, it's like maybe if you stopped for 20 minutes and then ate something and got back on your bike, you'd just be rolling again. Yeah. I mean, I never, I never walk at home. Like, I'm always like, like, I always, if I come in on a bike, I leave on a bike. I mean, there's been times where... I, I know you love going up hills. I, I got to tell you, there was one time where I was <laughs> kneeling on one knee and I punched the tar. I, I'm like, I hate you uphill. I I hate uphills. I can't <laughs> tell you, Lil. I hate them. I've I fought concrete before. I do not like going uphill. I mean, I love the challenge, but when I when I'm all beat up and I'm like, oh my god, like I don't know. I think it's I think it's it's just a matter of just getting out there and doing your thing. Like, so what do you do? How do you condition yourself? Granted, it's probably not 50 miles, but how do you get to the point where you're like, you have to push yourself just a little bit further? What's the strategy you use in, in your style and your method of riding? To push yourself a little bit further. I mean, like, if I know I'm going to be out there for weeks, it's, you know, it's not really a question. You know, you just have to stay on the bike. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. You know, this past year I started listening to music on the bike that's pretty fun I never did that before and I like it that can be kind of like a nice mindset change I guess um I don't know you know I just I guess when I when I started riding long distance I had like worse physical reactions like my first real long ride I rode 224 miles from my home in Anchorage to Homer Alaska 
And uh, the day after, it was like my knees were just super swollen, like all my joints swelled up. Um, but I think really your body kind of has a memory for what you put yourself through. And, you know, the next time I rode over 200 miles, it, I didn't react the same way. Mm. Um, so I guess the more you do it, the more normal it becomes. What is the split? Because I know you do a lot of mountain biking, but you've also done road and cyclocross. What's the split as far as what you ride? I mean, do you find yourself a lot in, a lot in the woods, doing the mountain biking, a lot in the road, Is it, or is it like a, a mix? I mean, I definitely ride a lot more dirt than pavement. Um, so that, you know, primarily what I'm best at is kind of dirt road riding with a lot of climbing. Mm. Um, you know, but it's always a mix. Like I'll, I'll do mountain biking on more single track trails and I also ride road. I ride gravel bikes. Um, I like to mix it up because you do too much of the same style and it kind of burns you out. Right. So it's like, you might be fat biking all winter and then hop on a road bike and it feels just incredible to have that speed. But then after, you know, a few weeks of road riding, um, uh, like after racing the Trans Am, then I just want to be back, you know, in the mountains, um, riding on dirt. So I really like kind of mixing it up. It makes it more exciting, but I don't know. I don't do a ton of technical riding, like technical mountain biking. That kind of scares me. Um, I really don't want to get hurt. I don't want to fall. I don't want to break bones. I fall enough as it is, so I'm kind of cautious. Because yeah. my worst nightmare is injuring myself and then not being able to be out there. Mm. Yeah. You know, so I'm, I'm kind of like trying to trying to just keep my body in physical condition so I can keep riding forever. Yeah, and what you used to do is when you when you graduated college, you kind of worked for. And I'm being approximate here. You worked for half a year, and then you kind of rode for half a year. I mean, you uh -huh. are really you're all about the bike. I mean, that's what's so one of the many things that's so impressive about your life. I mean, you are one of the when people say they live to ride, you are literally living to ride. Like you are proof of that. Yeah, but it's like you know, it's like it's riding, but then it's also traveling, and it's also. Um, just being in new experiences. So, I mean, it's, it's riding, but it's like, it's just like living on the bike. Yes. You know, it's like you do all the other stuff that you do in the day, but you just have the bike in between. So, I mean, I, I know you take, I mean, for, for those of you that don't know, you, you've taken various jobs and, and I couldn't find this anywhere. Are you sponsored at all by Specialized or is that just your bike? Yeah, I am. So this is the first year um, that I'm actually receiving money from Specialized. So, I think it started maybe in April, so pretty recently, very recently. And, um, yeah, so for the year, they're giving me $15,000, oh. which is, for me, incredible. It's more money than I've ever made in a year. Yeah. Um, so I'm pretty pumped. Are you still doing the, like, the occasional, you know, waitress job or working in restaurants? Are you yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I spent December and January working at a pizza place. And then I started guiding for the cyclist menu in February, and I was guiding in February and March. And then I went back to Alaska in April and May um, to lead this middle school girls cycling program um, that I do up there. Um, so I'm still doing little jobs if, if and when I need to, although the guiding was awesome. You know, I definitely plan on doing that again. I've never been a bike guide, and it's super fun. Um, but yeah, you know, I kind of am just doing what I need to to, to keep riding and, and to keep traveling. Um, the cool thing is, though, it's really not that expensive. You know, it's like, yeah, a few plane tickets here and there and buying food and um, minimal expenses. So it's like I can do this for $15,000 a year, basically, which is kind of unreal to think about. You know, that's like somebody making minimum wage, I don't know how much money they make, but it's definitely more than that. Yeah. Is, is, the, is the specialized bike that you ride, Lael, is that a hardtail? When you're, are, you, are you always mostly on a hardtail when you're in your <laughs> You know, uh, right now I'm on a hardtail. Um, in the spring when I was guiding, it was a gravel bike. Okay. So that's like more like a drop bar bike with bigger tires. Um, I rode a road bike this spring. I actually did this really cool trip where I flew – um, into Morgan Hill where Specialized is located and then I rode a thousand miles back to Tucson where I was living at the time um, so and that was on like a race road bike really fast really fun 
Um, so I, I kind of mix it up, but you know, if, if I were to go with one bike, it would be a, a hardtail for sure. Yeah. And do they, and, and this is, and I'm so sorry if this is like an elementary question, do they kind of open it up to, do they say, Lael, whatever you want is yours? They say, you know, it's basically like they're excited about the projects I tell them about. I was, I used to send them like a calendar saying like in April and May I'm doing this girls mentorship program. Would you be interested in sending 18 bikes there for the girls? And they say yes. Mm. And that's incredible. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's, yeah, I mean, people, people feel like it's magic. You know, it's this huge bike company sending 18 hardtail mountain bikes for 12 year old girls to ride and go on a big trip. And then they get to keep the bike. You know, stuff like that. So it's, it's always project to project, kind of how it works. Um, but I never uh, receive equipment for just because I want it. It's always going directly towards some kind of project or race or uh, tour. Um, it, it always has a plan. Because for me, it's also I don't live anywhere, so I don't have any need to have extra gear. You know, it's kind of like if I'm using it, that's great. If I'm not, then I give it away or I sell it. So you, you are, I mean, when you are there, you, you make your residence in Alaska though, right? When you're not on the bike or is it just, you have, well, that's just, just for two months out of the year. Right. Right. You know, I don't, I don't know if that would count as a residence. Not really. Yeah. Have a visit. Um, so Specialize has been super kind to you, but, and also, I mean, you don't have to say this, but you've kind of earned it, I think. I mean, you've done so many great things and we're going to get to this with, with kids and, and, and teaching and, and, and leading them. Um, and it's specialized is, is wonderful for what they're doing, but you're also wonderful for what you're doing. I mean, I would say you're long overdue to get something because I mean, you, I mean, people that know the sport know how good you, and Layla, I mean, people that are listening and maybe are new to, to biking, you are, you are legit. You are the real deal. You are, I mean, you're, you're not somebody that's going to go out there and brag about how great you are, but I'll do it for you. You are legitimate in the world of biking. There's no question about that. Hey, I, I appreciate that. You know, I mean, the thing is, is, I'm doing it because it's what I want to be doing. And, um, you know, sometimes it takes a while for stuff to come together. It's like the pace I'm going, it's just so rapid that I'm not waiting for, you know, I'm not waiting for the money to come in. I'm not waiting for any acclaim. I'm just, I'm just moving forward. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited that I get to do so many different things in the year and, you know, at this point, if I don't have to get a job at a pizza place in the fall, I'd be pretty excited about that, too. Even though I like that, it's just everything takes time. Um, so, yeah, you know, the more the more I can spend on the bike, the more I can spend riding with other people, the, the better off I am. Yeah, and one of your points you made earlier, and I, and I completely agree, was, yeah, you do bike, but it's the, it's some of it's bike. I mean, a lot of it is biking, but it's the idea of, going to different places, experiencing new things. You know, you've I've just wrote down a couple all across the US, you know, Eastern Europe, Middle East, Africa, Mexico. Have you ever found yourself in a position, um, Lael, going to any of these places where you were scared or was there a situation that, you know, I don't want to say frightened, that's probably over the top, where you were, I don't know, I, I, have there ever been situations that have unfolded where you've, you've been a little bit, I don't know, upset maybe? You know, I mean, things can get hard if the weather's if the weather's bad. It's tough. You know, you end up in a storm and you don't have enough clothing. You don't have a shelter. You have hard moments, but after you've experienced them, it's, it's not as bad the second time around. Um, I've never really felt in danger. That's, uh, yes. We, we did talk about the Highway of Tears briefly a minute ago, and that was, a, I think, a 300-mile stretch of road I rode in Canada that was – notorious for um women getting kidnapped on this road mm. and uh so that was pretty creepy but you know even even during that ride i had people opening their doors to me being so kind and, and uh helping me out so i mean it's like anything i've heard of places being dangerous and you know people will tell you don't go to israel don't go to palestine don't go to egypt don't go to mexico and saying that, you know, I'm going to get killed, and then I end up going to these places, and the people are wonderful. Mm -hmm. and they're nothing but hospitable and curious, and um, so, you know, I've really never had a bad time um, with the people. Mm. You know, and it's like, there are so many things you could just sit up at night feeling afraid of, like wildlife in Alaska, 
but it's like, is that going to stop me from traveling through these places? It's like, no way I want to be there. Um, so I, I would say my answer is I, I really haven't had any negative experiences. Um, you know, there, there are definitely challenges and like trying moments when things are really uncomfortable or really difficult. Um, but you know, nothing that would turn me around and make me want to stop living this life. No, and that's yeah. I mean, you're 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 one brave soul for sure. And have have you ever encountered like animals and like uh, how do you handle that? I mean, do you do you manage just to kind of be calm during a moment like that? Yeah, I mean, I've seen like hundreds of bears. You know, I I mean, maybe I wouldn't say hundreds, but definitely over a hundred. Right. And uh, uh, just. You know, you just have to be tougher than the bear and just yell, you know, and that's it. And they usually just turn and run away. Um, I never really had like a terrible experience with animals, but sometimes you're there and they're there and you just have to figure out, you know, how you both are going to get out of the situation. Because, you know, for the most part, animals don't want to attack you. They're pretty afraid too. Um, you, they just don't want to feel threatened. Yeah, that's well said, and I, I don't know if you and I have the same reaction because I think I'd be I don't I can't even imagine what my reaction would be. Um, you know, what's the longest you've been on a bike at one time, Lael? Mm, the longest uh, distance? Yeah, at one at one time without getting off yeah, distance, so, right? Yeah. Oh, without getting off at all, like pee or anything? Right, just this is you on a bike, no bathroom no. break. This is but, what's the longest you've been on a bike? You know, I really don't know. I pee a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, it's like I don't know. I don't think I can go like a hundred miles without stopping at pee. Okay, let, let me ask you another way. How about um, how about at one on one ride? In other words, where you decide to call it a, a, a night or a day? What's the longest sure. miles you've traveled? Well, there's this race. My first race it was actually the Fire Me 400. So it's a 400 mile road race. Um, and I rode that in a day. Wow. So that would definitely be the longest just because it was one, you know, one race, one event. So it's like you just plug away and get it done. And that took me 27 hours. So, um, so that, you know, that would be my longest one day distance. Like how are, how are you doing 400 miles in a day? And I think I'm like a Tour de France champion for doing like 40 or 50 miles. Like how is that? How it's they, all the same. You know, you're just pedaling. I don't think 400 miles is necessarily better than 40 or 50. It's just longer. Oof. That's very impressive. I mean, I, I to me, that's – that's it's unbelievable. Never mind 27 hours, which is even more um, uh, ridiculous. I, I can't even put my, my, my head around that. Um, so the Highway to Tears, I mean, I, I read about how nice people were to you. This is like a like a thing where people like girls have and you you touched on this. Girls have gone missing, whether it's due to bears or other factors. It's, um, I mean, it's really from like hitchhiking. Yeah. Okay. okay. You know, so it's like girls have gone missing from from being kidnapped, and you know, it's not even just like a couple. It's like the numbers are are horrifying. It's like. Yes you know, 30 or something like that. And uh, so they have these billboards on the roadside that are like public service announcements showing photographs of women that have gone missing and telling their information. It's so creepy. It's just like, ooh, what happened to them? And then you look at a billboard and you're like, wow, that kind of looks like me. <laughs> it's, it's a woman that's gone. Um, and then it, it kind of disperses this, fear and this really weird energy on the road where people are constantly talking about it. And I think, you know, them seeing me by them by myself would kind of trigger this reaction where they would say, do you know that you're on the highway of tears? And then they would tell me some really disturbing stories. Um, but you know, it's like, I think those stories just continue the, the kind of feeling you know, it's like those people are in fear, too, of the situation. They don't have any control. And people kind of feed off of terror. You know, it's like people are always talking about the bad events and the, the negative things that have happened instead of the positive. Um, but, yeah, for me, I was like, I went off of this road. And it was 
at the time I was riding like a hundred miles a day through Canada. So I was, I slept, you know, on this highway three nights and I was like, I just wanted to get out of there. Mm. But you did, but yeah, you, again, you slept on the side of the road in a bush, I think, right? I mean, one of the nights. For two of the nights. And then on the third day, there was a crazy thunderstorm and it was just pouring rain. And I think I was about 80 miles into my day and uh, I was dead set on getting past this highway till I like turned off the road. And I think I had like another 40 miles to go or something like that. And, and then, you know, I had these huge trucks driving past me and like, showering me with water and I was like whoa you know it kind of hit me that it was you know what I was doing was super dangerous they couldn't see me you know it was just pouring right right um, yeah so then I saw this little RV park or something like that on the side of the road with an open sign and I just pulled off and um <laughs> I walk into this little cafe and these ladies come out with towel with a towel for me they were just so shocked to see me because I was just drenched and it was a huge storm, and um, you know, after that, the the people there really took care of me. I spent the night, and then I headed out the next morning. Is that the toughest spot you've ever? Not the toughest spot. Is that the worst place you've ever been, as far as just the circumstances around it? I think that was probably when I had the most anxiety. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was like, this is really bad. Like, I was starting to feel just, like, paranoid, you know, like I couldn't trust people, which is really unusual for me. But just having so many people kind of tell me how bad the situation was really made it feel bad. Um, when it really wasn't, it was fine. You know, and I wasn't even in – I wasn't in danger. You know, it's not like I was falling for off a cliff or something. I was just on the road. Right. Um, but it was, it was definitely a weird, weird place to be. Yeah, and I wanted to ask you, you know, just in general, this is not so much about you, but just, you know, bicyclists in general, why there seems to be, at least in my area, like so much like hate and animosity towards bicyclists. Like it's I don't get where where does that come from? Like I don't like I what is wrong with people trying to get healthy and see the world? I don't like I can't wrap my head around that either. I don't understand. You know, but then you think about that and it's like it's probably just like you know, two percent of all the people you're encountering, probably the rest of them are like, "Oh, it's fine." Yeah. You know, but it's like those those two bad ones out of a hundred that just make you feel terrible. They like honk at you or yell at you or whatever. But it's really it's not a lot of people. It's just a couple. But that's what sticks. You know, it's always this negative stuff that sticks with you instead of like, "Wow, I had a great ride." It's like, "Oh, that asshole that yelled at me." <laughs> you yeah, that's, what, it, that's that's like life, right? You remember the. You could have ten. You remember the bad stuff, yeah. and it's like not everybody hates you. It's just that one guy. <laughs> That's true. That's very true. You're right. I never thought about it that way. Um, so what you were talking about before, and I want to talk, kind of getting a little more positive here. It, it, it's it's the program that you're a part of. Is that called Anchorage Grit? Is that do I have that right? Mm -hmm. That's right. And and you you get is that the program where specialized donated the bicycles? Am I right with that? Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and what do you teach kids? So say if, say um. And I know mom's a teacher. I don't know if it's related, but is is did you just go there and teach kids how to, you know, do do maintenance? You know how to um, approach you know uh, situations on a bike. Um, what to do in you know various um, you know obstacles. How, what is the your philosophy or, or what is the what do you really want to teach these kids? Yeah, so I designed this program with a good friend, Kate, and the whole thing is it's a six week after school program for girls that leads up to a three day, um, adventure bicycle camp out trip. Um, so I mean, the main thing is for them to get the miles in so they can go for this ride, which is pretty tough. It's 65 miles and I don't know, 3,300 feet of climbing, something like that. It's, I mean, it's, it's hard. Um, so really we're just trying to get them on the bike and, and get them ready for the trip. So, um, every session we meet them at their school, they go for a ride to a workshop and then ride back. And then we go for longer rides on the weekends. Um, but we do try to teach them some skills like fixing a flat tire. And then also things like, uh, we do a bag making class with a local, uh, 
bicycle bag maker. So they help make their own tanniers and then we kind of go over, you know, how to pack the bags and what they should bring for the trip. Um, we go over safe riding. So kind of how to ride in traffic, um, trail etiquette. We do mountain bike skills class. So it's a, it's a lot of different things, but it's really kind of, uh, the whole thing is to give them confidence to, to ride their bikes, to go for this trip. And it's not even, you know, the biking is really cool, but it's also just, that's an age where girls are starting to make their own decisions. There's a lot of change happening. So it's really, it's not competitive, but it's about being active and being outside um, and challenging themselves. Yeah, and it's, so, it's truly people. a wonderful sport. And for them to have a role model like you, my goodness, those kids must be in awe. I mean, they must be so appreciative. Oh, it's, it's awesome. But, but for me, it's like, you know, when they first get on the bikes in April, uh, they can hardly even, like, sit on them. They have no skills. They have no balance. They're really scared. And then by the end of it, they're, like, jumping over logs. It's incredible. It's, and it's only six weeks. It's like the, the amount they can improve in that time is unreal. So that's pretty cool. And then for them to even, like, they recognize what they've done and it's a huge achievement. So I think that's pretty cool. You know, it's like, I'm not looking for them to be become like me and just live on the bike, but it's more about taking on challenges and, and not being afraid and kind of putting yourself out of your comfort zone. Yeah. And, it, and that must be really nice, you know, giving those kids confidence, you know, Hey, I've, I've ridden 10 miles or 20 miles or, you know what? I went a mile more than I did yesterday. I mean, that's, so all that it's stuff huge. is, yeah, confidence builder, big time for those kids, uh, you know, at an age where they, where they need it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's really cool, you know, it's, um, it is all girls and it's all female mentors and it's all women teachers. So it's kind of a different environment for them. You know, it's like, uh, you don't spend a lot of time where you're just surrounded all by women or all by men. It's, it changes the dynamic. They feel, I feel like the pressure's kind of off their shoulders. They can be a little more like themselves and, and try a little harder, which is nice to see. Yeah, and one of your bigger achievements uh, is is the Trans Am bike race, which is from Yorktown to – where's the where's – the, and you could – It's uh, – it is – the town is on the Oregon coast, and I'm totally blanking the name right now. Uh, but basically, Oregon coast to Virginia coast. And you can choose which way you want to go, right? So you could start either in Virginia or Oregon, right? You can – is that – Definitely, how yeah. Um, but there are always predominant winds coming out of the west. So it's it's better to go west to east. Gotcha, gotcha. And, you know, I, I you know the movie Inspire – I know you won it in 2016. Amazing. What, what was it over? 4,000? What's the mileage? 4,300 4, miles. Jeez, 4,300 miles. And was inspired to ride the same year you won that? No, Inspired to Ride was uh, the year I raced the Tour Divide. Okay, I got so you. So that's 2015. Gotcha. And, and when you, how do cyclists look at each other? Do like baseball players might look at each other like competitively. Are cyclists supportive uh, for the most part? Yeah, it, I don't know. I think it really depends on the person. You know, the thing with this ultra racing, people are pretty friendly because it's it's pretty crazy to be out there. You know, it's like. You're self-supported. You never know what's going to happen. So usually people are pretty cool. Um, but I, I don't know. I think it's a mix. Did you ever have the chance, um, Lael, to meet Mike Hall? I didn't. Uh, we just corresponded through, like, emails and Facebook messages. Um, because actually right before the Trans Am, I was thinking, oh, maybe it'd be really cool if I raced the Trans Am and then continued on to, like, go after the around the world record, mm. um, which was like a totally crazy plan. But as I wrote Mike and I was like, what do you think? And he's like, I've always thought that would be a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so cool. Yeah. And he's I mean, like, you know, you definitely have to like arrange some visas and this kind of stuff. And it's like at that, for that year that I raised the Trans Am, I made a total of $4,400 for the whole year. You know, it's like I couldn't afford any of this traveling logistics. I didn't have a sponsor. You know, there's like I couldn't put this together, but it was kind of a dream at the time. And uh, so Mike was really cool about that and um, super supportive guy. But we never ended up in the same place at the same time. 
Um, so I didn't get to meet him. Yeah, I, I had. I was dying to ask you that. You know, and he he seemed like you a very you know nice person. You know, good good man. And um, uh, unfortunate how things unfolded. But he's featured and inspired to ride as well. But um, yeah, I mean, I just it's just. How many miles do you think, uh, Lil? For a while there, you were doing twenty thousand a year. How many years was that for? Or was that just for one given year? That was for about three years. Uh, so I guess let me see. Now we're in twenty eighteen, so that would have been fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. But I mean, this year I don't think I'll hit twenty thousand. Um, what do you figure, like nineteen five? <laughs> maybe i don't know i have this really pretty crazy summer plan but uh i don't know you know because it's like i was guiding so for those days i was probably riding more like 50 to 90 a day um so that's a little bit less than <laughs> than average but you know it's like uh yeah i don't know and i wasn't touring which adds a ton of of miles just cause your day every day you're riding. Um, so I don't know, but I, I haven't been calculating. Um, usually it's kind of easy cause I know the distance I've like toured across the country and I know the distance of my races, but this year I'm just kind of like all over the place. You know, in, a, in a non-race situation, will you ride your, um, your hardtail mountain bike on the road, N- not dirt road. I mean like, like the pavement, do you find yourself just like, you know, if you have to run a couple of errands, do you ever do something like, it's a stupid question, but I'm just, Curious if you ever do that. If you ever just say, you know what, I'm just, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna rip off twenty miles on the bike. Just not not in a, like a um, a dirt situation, but on a pavement situation. Absolutely, because I've never owned a car, you know. So I'm riding whatever bike I have to do everything I have to do. Wow. So so you you you've gone long distances on on pavement with a mountain bike. Of course. Wow. Wow. That is very impressive. Um, <laughs> what do you do, Lael? And I hope you don't think this is an odd question, but do you like, so if, when I bring my car in, right, my car needs an oil, you know, oil change and needs a a tune up. What do you do for your body, for your mind to kind of, I don't know, to not fix it, but like to maintain, I mean, there's no way you can keep going. Maybe you can, because you're, 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 you've done some pretty impressive things. Do you ever like, maybe I'm just throwing this out there. Like, so maybe some athletes get like a massage. Some athletes talk to therapists. I'm not saying you do, but like, is there any type of, mental oil change or body you know, that, that you do? I've, um, I've been doing yoga since I was 16. Mm. I think that's super helpful um, for my mobility and flexibility and also mentally really good. And then this summer, or I mean, this when I was in Anchorage, I got um, some acupuncture and cupping and deep massage, and I think that really, really helped. Uh, I think I went like four sessions um, but I'm, I'm here in Switzerland riding in the mountains a lot, doing a lot of climbing and I've never had such great breathing. Um, so it's super awesome. You know, with this stuff, you never know what's going to work, but I think I found something really good. Yeah. So good. I mean, it's good that yeah, yoga and, and you kind of do take care of yourself, which is, which is fantastic. Um, what advice do you give to people, Lael, whether it's kids or adults, they say, look, I- I'm getting into biking you know, I, I, I look up to you, not necessarily look up to you, but, you know, I admire you. I, I really, I love what you've done with the sport. You know, I want to get into it. What advice do you have for those people? Yeah, I'd say uh, go for it. You know, it's, uh, I mean, the thing I love with biking is, is the places that you can go and then also going for overnights or going for longer trips. So if people are curious about that, it, it doesn't really take much. You just make a plan, maybe start from your home and, and go out for an overnight carrying your camping gear and then ride home again. Mm-hmm. Um, and see if you like it. If you don't, that's fine. Then move on do something else. Um, I feel like people have aspirations, but if they never pursue them, they never actually find what they really like. Cause you might try a bunch of different things and then, and then it all changes, but finally you find what you love and, and then, and then that's it. That's kind of the goal. Yeah, so I mean, I have to say, I, when you first start getting into biking, and even today, you know, you, you you show up, and this is admittedly, you've said this before, you show up in your t-shirt, your spandex, your tennis shoes, and I'm sure when you show up some of these races, people are like, oh yeah, right, and then you blow them away. Like you have to know, I mean, in society in general, people judge each other by how they look, and when you show up like this and then completely leave people in the dust, is that gratifying? Yeah, and it's well, it's mind blowing for people, but it's also like that's 
part of the reason why I race, I mean, you know, I love being out there, but if I just loved riding, I would just ride all the time and not race. You know, part of racing is getting results and, uh, and trying to win. And so, you know, after you, after you do these things, then people, it kind of changes their perception. They're like, Oh, maybe, maybe you can do this without all the right equipment or all the equipment everybody says you should have, or you, maybe you can do it if you're a woman, like all these kind of doors open where people are like starting to consider a different path. You don't have to wear, you know, bike outfit and shave your legs and, and not eat bread. You can do whatever you want. It's, it's all about results. Um, how long did it take you to become an effective mechanic to the point, Lael, where you can, you know, work on your own bike, no problem. You can, you know, change a, you know, a broken rim or, you know, maybe go you to know, I, I can't do all that stuff. But the thing is you don't have to, there are bike shops all over the world. I mean, you have to keep yourself rolling. You know, you have to be able to do a few things. You have to be able to really a big one is just keeping air in your tires. You know, it's like if you have a tubeless setup like I do, there are a lot of things that could potentially happen that you have to be able to fix. Or if you break your chain, you have to be able to fix that or, you know, more minor things. A lot of things can happen to the bike where you can actually keep rolling. You just have to get it fixed after a certain amount of time. Um, so I feel competent in, in uh, riding and, and being able to do field service, but you know, if I'm in town, I'm definitely taking my bike to the shop because those guys are way better at it than I am. Yeah, but but Leo, you have to like you said it yourself. You have to be field sufficient, right? You have to be able to because there's a lot of people like riding bikes today that if they have a flat tire, the ride's over, they're going home. But you have to be able to change a tire. You have to be able to do the chain, which you know can be tricky. You have to be able to do like those little things. But those little things take experience and time and and, and practice. Wouldn't, wouldn't you agree with that? Yeah, I would, but I think, you know, go ride your bike and have a problem and then try to fix it, you know, or if you're, if you want to learn these things, um, watch a YouTube video. I don't know. It's like, there's so many, there's so many ways to learn now that it's like, if you feel, don't let that be the, the limiting factor. The reason why you don't go for a bike ride is because you don't know how to fix your chain. I mean, that's ridiculous. Most people never break a chain. I've never broken a chain, Yeah. but it's like, it can happen. You know, so it's good to, that's something that could happen. But then there are other things that could happen that I definitely can't fix. Like, you know, I, I run hydraulic disc brakes. If, if uh, you know, one of them went out while I was riding, I wouldn't be able to fix it. But I'd be like, well, at least I have one other brake. And <laughs> just keep riding until I get to a bike shop. Yeah, and, and yeah, and I, and I don't mean, yeah, you're right. I mean, but I think though, when people bike, though, you're right. They should make themselves kind of knowledgeable in just the basics so they can keep riding, you know? They should be able to fix a flat tire. Yes. I th- thank you for saying that. I totally agree. And, and w- when you prepare for a race, right? So how do you decide what to take? Because I've seen your sleeping bag on, on more than one YouTube video, right? It's, it, it's, it, it looks very, um, I don't know how you keep warm in that. You know, I mean, it depends on the conditions of the race. I I look at, I kind of, especially kind of the week before the race, I obsess over the weather. And, and, um, you know, like right now I'm in Switzerland. The highs are 76. The lows are 60 degrees. I'm going for a ride tomorrow, and I'm not even bringing pants. (laughs) Like, this is pretty great. But then it's like I'm racing here in two weeks, and if I see straight rain in the forecast, I'll probably bring, like, full rain jacket and rain pants and a bunch of extra layers. So it really kind of depends on what I'm setting out to do. Um, I always bring kind of minimal tools that, you know, I I can use if something happens. Um, But it's, it's, you know, sleeping system depends. When I'm racing, I'm just going to use this insulated bivy. But for tomorrow, I'm bringing uh, an air mattress and, like a summer weight sleeping bag and a ground cloth so I can sleep out, and I think that would be fine. Um, you know, sometimes I carry, like in Alaska last summer, I carry a really lightweight tent because the mosquitoes are so bad. Uh, so, you know, I kind of look at the setting and then decide, but I always go for less than more because it's so much more fun to ride your bike if it's light. Yeah, so you're not bogged down. So you're training right now for a race in a couple of weeks in Switzerland? I am. So the race is the Divide 1000. It's 1,000 kilometers um, with 30,000 meters of climbing. So that's like 620 miles with 
over a hundred thousand feet of climbing, it's it's going to be brutal. <laughs> it's so much elevation. Um, so yeah, tomorrow I'm going out. Uh, actually, for the next two days to ride the first 250 miles, um, which has which is basically the first half of the race and uh, and with half the climbing. So this is kind of a test to see what I can do out there. Um, but the weather looks perfect, and I'm going to spend a night out, and then on the second day I'll stay with somebody else that's going to be racing, so I get to meet some of the other racers and. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's all for fun, but it's all kind of in preparation for the race too, which is pretty cool. So how many miles, and if you said this, I'm sorry, how many miles will you put in tomorrow? Tomorrow I'll ride like around 120. Um, but the, you know, it's kind of tricky because that sounds like, oh, not that much, but with all the climbing, it's going to take me all day. It's going to be really hard. Um, so, so we'll see how it goes. You know, I haven't seen this train yet, but I know it's going to be tough. Yeah, and so the one thing you do really well is you have a great personality. You develop this rapport with people, and and that's got to be part of that whole adventure, part of the adventure piece that you were talking about earlier. You know, it's not just riding a bike; it's everything encompassed together. Leo must make your life just such a special life. You know, just such a wonderful experience. You know, for those people looking out the window at the nine to five job, I mean, they must be people must be envious of, of what you kind of do. Not that it's this walk in a park. It's very difficult to do what you do. There's no question about that. But, I mean... But this lifestyle is available to almost everybody that has a 9-to-5. You just have to decide you don't want to make any money. That's you know, I mean, <laughs> that's what I've been doing for 10 years. And year 11, I'm getting paid $15,000. Sure. You know, I think if, if everybody else kind of looked at the money they made in that time, it would be quite a bit more than that. Is, is there something that you're most proud of, Lael, than anything that you've ever achieved? And you've achieved some really wonderful things. Is there anything that stands out to where you're like, you know what, I keep going back to that in my head. I love that moment. You know, I mean, there are a few. Like doing the grit program, um, kind of making this from nothing was huge. Um, for the girls, you know, it's cool to, to just make that happen. I mean, we worked with schools. I had no idea kind of even how to start. And then um, organizing that was really cool, and it's cool to see the girls improve. Uh, winning the Trans Am was a pretty huge moment for me. The last day was incredible to realize that I was actually going to win this thing, and I worked so hard for it. Um, that was cool. You know, the year before, I had raced the Tour Divide and ridden to the start twice in a summer so I rode 9,000 miles in three months that was pretty huge mm. um basically that but you know really it's it's not even I mean I don't know I just I'm always ready to move on you know it's like one thing ends and then I'm excited about the next and I think that's kind of the best part about it yeah and, and I, I I hinted at this earlier, but do you have I know you said you listen to music and so forth, but there's some long stretches and I'm just thinking of the trans Am where it's nothing but you and your bike. I mean, outside of your music, what goes through your head? What are you thinking about? Like I've heard bicyclists talk about this. Um, and one of the guys in the movie mentioned this. he says, you know it's almost he, he didn't say he goes insane, but it's very repetitive in what goes on in his head. What do you kind of deal with in your mind? Is it just, you know what, let me look back at my clock in an hour, let me, how does that work? No way. You know, I actually crave that time because I spend so much time with people that I'm like, I'm just looking forward to being out there. And uh, I have just like so many memories and so many different thoughts and ideas that, I'm, that are going through my mind during that that I never get bored yeah, I mean, that's just amazing. And this, my last question to you, and thank you so much for giving me almost an hour of your time. I know you're going for a huge ride tomorrow. Um, so what's the race called? I don't know if it's a race, but it's it was one of your um, um, one of the things you accomplished where you wanted to ride every road in Alaska. I don't think we mentioned that yet. Yeah, so that was just a project that I thought of in 2014 um, before I was racing, and it was just it came from just like, staring at a map and starting to do these long rides. But in that summer, I decided, well, one day I want to ride all of the major roads in Alaska, which sounds sounds kind of crazy, but it's actually manageable. There are only really 12 major roads in Alaska. 
um, totaling something of like 4,500 miles. Oh my gosh. And so I set out last summer and did it and it was really cool. You know, it's like riding these roads is one thing to, to complete a road, but they're all, almost all of them are dead end. So I'd be like, I'd ride, you know, a thousand miles up to, to the North slope up to Prudhoe Bay and then I was there and I'm like, Oh my gosh, I got to get back. So I, I had all these funny experiences hitchhiking with different people because I was like well I don't have to ride in both directions you know because I was like I've got to get back to Anchorage to go to work the time I was working at a bicycle shop um so I would go out for a week or two and then come back and work for a week or two and then set back out um but it was really really cool to be out there I grew up in Alaska you know I'm fourth generation Alaskan so I've got a lot of family history there so for me to be able to see all this was pretty special project. Is there one ultimate goal left for you that you really haven't done yet? Is it the around the world, uh, through the world that you were talking about? Is that something you think you'll try? No, I don't. Um, you know, I like races that are continuous around the world. It's like you, you can kind of make your own track and I don't think it sounds that great. Um, I, you know, I don't really have a big goal right now. I've got, Three races this summer. I'm trying to win all of them, so that's kind of where I'm at. Uh, Lael, I want to wish you luck in the upcoming race, and I cannot thank you enough for giving me almost an hour of your time. Heck yeah, and I'm going to wake up in four hours and go ride 120 miles. Best wishes, Lael. I <laughs> wish you luck. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Ask yourself.